All right, hello, hello again, Ling201. Uh, today I wanna to walk you through a, a brief lecture on knowledge of language, uh, sort of to set the stage for the more technical analysis we're gonna do for most of the rest of the class on the, grammatic, uh, the grammatical structures of language. Um, so this is a lecture that's largely based on a reading that I have posted. Um, if you go to the 201 homepage and look at the readings uh, tab, there's a couple here, one um, from Steven Pinker, which we'll talk a little bit about next time, and then also one from Ray Jackendoff on the argument for mental gra grammar from his uh, book, Patterns in the Mind. Um, there is uh, also a brief uh, reading here about the origins of language. Uh, I'll actually click on that one real quick. This one is um, a little bit about uh, how we know how old um, language is in uh, the human species uh, and, and based on kind of this vocal tract analysis that I was talking about in the previous lecture. Um, so you can look through that. It's just from, it's from a very cool book called the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Language, which uh, kind of touches upon like a whole wide variety of um, linguistic issues that uh, I used to like when I was uh, a lot younger than I am now. <laughs> and uh, you might enjoy it too. Um, it's more for kind of uh, fun analysis of language rather than the in-depth sort of stuff that we're going to do in the rest of the semester, but um, you get, can still get a lot out of it. Anyways, uh, the reading from Jack and Off that I mentioned is here. Uh, it's just about seven pages long, so I'd recommend that you read through that before we go through this lecture. Um, I'm also going to mention that there is, if I can find it, I should have, uh, loaded this up before I started the lecture, but there is a quick write for this lecture as well. Um, and it can be found here. It's unpack your adjectives. So uh, got you, I've given you a variety of different choices for ways to express different sentences. I want you to pick the one that sounds the best to you and then explain why you think that one is the best. Uh, and we'll kind of come back around to that by the end of this lecture. Okay, so knowledge of language. What are we talking about when we talk about knowledge of language? So to start off um, here, I'm gonna go back to the idea that um, one of the crucial design features of language is creativity, or uh, you can call it productivity as well, from Charles Hockett's analysis or framework for understanding the features of language. So Charles Hockett himself had these quotes to say about um, this particular property. So he said, language users can create and understand completely novel messages. We've talked about that at some length. Uh, and he also said, in a language, new messages are freely coined by blending, analogizing from, or transforming old ones. This says that every language has grammatical patterning. Um, in a language, either new or old elements are freely assigned new semantic loads by circumstances and context. This says that in every language, new idioms constantly come into existence. Um, yeah, so this second quote here is kind of touching on a lot of the things that Ray Jackendoff talks about in his uh, little chapter um, on knowledge of language. So grammatical patterning, that's, yeah, the topic of his book is patterns in the mind. Uh, and we're going to go into grammar starting today. Uh, and uh, just to explain here, semantic loads is maybe a fancy word for saying meanings. Uh, so new or old elements can acquire new meanings. Um, so that means that new idioms can come into existence. We've talked about a few of those as well. But the question is, like, what makes this possible? It's an amazing ability that we have, uh, and it's a great adaptive ability we have. So, I mean, there's a bit of a debate about whether, you know, the faculty of language in human beings is something which, you know, is uh, helped us, or sort of, I guess, selected for, uh, according to, like, environmental forces in the world around us as biological beings. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but it definitely helps us uh, adapt to new circumstances because we can describe them and communicate them to other members of our species or people we might want, might want to talk to and work together with, right? Uh, so how is that possible? How do we have that ability? Um, let's try to break it down into sort of like a formal expression or analysis. And I'll start off with uh, sort of the communication system that the bees had that we talked about a couple times ago. So honeybees can produce a variety of different dance messages. You can think about these again in like a mathematical way. So remember that there was the one particular tail, tail wagging dance where uh, they would kind of go in a semicircle and then waggle through the middle and then go around the other semicircle and waggle through the middle. Uh, and the angle through the middle um, told you something about the direction of the food source 
with respect to the sun. So this, you can maybe translate this sort of dance pattern into this expression in human language that there's a food source beyond 65 feet, fly at a zero degree angle with the sun or basically straight toward the sun. And in this case, you're gonna be flying at a 45 degree angle with the sun. You can interpret that if you're a honeybee uh, based on sort of the angle with respect to the vertical in the honeybee hive. Um, yeah, so that's pretty impressive. And it's pretty easy with like, um, different directions in the dances like this to figure out exactly where the bees are supposed to fly. I guess they don't need to get it exactly, but um, there's maybe a limit on the number of messages that the bees could produce with this system according to how many different angles they could differentiate in the um, dancing itself. So like, you know, we ex can express degrees in terms of numbers uh, in our mathematical slash slash language system that we have at our disposal. So we can get kind of as specific as we want to about this. We could talk about flying at a one degree angle or a two degree angle or, you know, even finer grain angles than that. Uh, and you could use in the modern day and age GPS to get you exactly there, however you need to navigate it. Um, so you could, if the bees can discriminate all these different degrees um, or angles, in their dancing, then they could, you know, say all these things to themselves too. Uh, one question you might think of though, uh, I presented this stuff to uh, many different classes over the years and I've gotten many different clever responses about it from many different clever students. Uh, you might be one of them, I don't know. Uh, but in the past, uh, a clever student has raised the issue of how creative this is because can the bees dance at angles they haven't seen before? So let's say you're growing up as a honeybee and you you know, have seen two dances in your life in your like two day old life or something. Uh, and you've seen this one and you've seen this one. Well, can you figure out like what this one is, the two degree angle dance? Um, and the answer is probably, right? That's what the honeybees are there for. Otherwise, why would they be doing the dancing? I don't know exactly how long it takes them to acquire the system in terms of perception, but it's probably there genetically. Uh, and the way it works, at least formally thinking, is that if the honeybees are dancing according to a pattern, according to a rule, then yeah, you can figure out what new like dances that fit into the same pattern would mean, right? Um, so we can express that rule again formally using sort of linguistic algebra here by saying, uh, well, there's a food source beyond 65 feet and then fly at X degree angle with the sun where X corresponds to the um, degree angle that I'm making on the honeybee hive wall. I keep saying honeybee hive. I guess I could just say hive wall. Um, anyways, but the bees have to know the rule in order for that to work. And it's a funny kind of knowledge, right? Because they're probably not expressing it like this in their minds where they can think in terms of like abstract algebraic variables or what have you. They just know that, well, if they see this pattern happening, they got to go, you know, exhibit this behavior and then they get rewarded with food. Um, so they know it in that sense. But knowing that rule and being able to differentiate in those sort of different patterns um, enables them to exhibit creativity, so sort of linguistic creativity or communication creativity in that sense. They can dance, you know, show new dance patterns on the wall that they haven't seen before or done before, and it will still make sense to the other bees in the hive. Um, yeah, so we can kind of compare that to the sort of creativity that we have in human language. Like we don't do those dances, but we could. It would be weird um, and it might be the sort of strange thing that linguists do at a linguistics party, who knows. Um, but we could, without dancing, say translations of everything the bees can say. So you could say like fly at a one degree angle with the sun. And again, you can put these you know, instructions into your navigator in your airplane or your car or whatever fancy machine you might have and it will get you there. Um, we're able to sort of program things that way and we get more detailed than probably the bees can. So we talk about like fly to 45 degree, 13 minute, 27.6, whatever, second angle with the sun. Um, yeah, we can get really specific now. That's nice, but that's a different sort of ability than a more broad or broader grammatical ability that we have. Um, aside from getting really specific about numbers, there's a different kind of pattern that we observe in human language. So we can say other things that the bees cannot say. Uh, I'm going to give you an example from the Ray Jackendorf reading. Um, these are kind of inane, but 
hopefully they get the point across through repetition. So you can say a numeral is not a numskull, a numeral is not a nun, a numeral is not a nunnery, blah, 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 saying the same thing over and over again. A nun is not a nursery, and hopefully you can see what's going on here, that Ray Jackendoff opened up his dictionary to the end section and just kind of plopped in different end words here and was kind of going through the whole cycle of nouns in the end part of the dictionary. And once he got through all the numeral comparisons, he started going down through the none comparisons. Uh, and you can keep making new sentences this way over and over and over again. Oh, an oboe is not an octopus. Oh, he got all the way down to oh. Good, that probably took a long time. And again, this would be easier to do in the modern day and age with a computer. You can make you know, a little computer program to spit this stuff out very quickly. Uh, we can do this as human beings without a computer. At least we can understand what these sentences mean. Who knows why we would ever say them, uh, but we can, right? So this is part of the issue of like how functional is language. We can say all these things. It probably, in most cases, is not of adaptive benefit for us to say a numeral is not a numskull, but it's there. We've got it in case it ever does become useful. <clears throat> okay, so those are interesting but novel sentences. In order to understand them, you must know the rule by which they are constructed, sort of like the bees had to know the rules for dancing in their honey beehive. Um, so the rule in this particular case, we'll also express it sort of algebraically, and we'll say any, like you can make a sentence out of this pattern in English, a x is not a y. Uh, and if you want to say NX is not a way, that's fine by me. Um, we'll talk about why you might want to do that when we get into phonology in a bit. Uh, but basically for X and Y here, you're going to substitute different nouns into that pattern. And as long as X and Y are not the same thing, this is going to be a true statement in English. Um, yeah, so knowledge of rules is more abstract than just knowledge, is, knowledge of individual sentences. You need to know have knowledge of patterns of sentences and this when as soon as we start sort of expressing these in terms of variables where different nouns can fit into these slots then we're talking about patterns of sentences rather than individual sentences um, so i'm going to draw this out uh hopefully explicitly enough here by putting different sentences in this brain here which just so happens to be my brain um i'm lucky enough to uh have one for who knows what reason but in this model let's say this is everything in your professor's brain there's three sentences a nun is not a nursery fly at a 45 degree angle with sun and I like linguistics that's it those are the contents of my thoughts that's the limit of my world uh, all we know in this particular case are these individual sentences uh, so there are no rules I just have specific things I can say um, and if this were the case this would be good enough to describe the verbit's language, or if uh, you remember the quick write on the prairie dogs, their language as well. Uh, so their communication system, like the verbit, has specific calls that it uses for specific predators. They're not these. The verbit doesn't say, I like linguistics. It says, oh, watch out, there's a leopard. Do whatever it takes to get out of the leopard's way, right? Uh, but there's no higher level patterning in what the verbit does. There's just one random call associated with a particular predator. Okay. A more abstract model of communication is this one where you can start to use these algebraic variables like x is not a y, x at a y degree angle with the z, or x likes y, so on and so forth. In this model, we know all the rules we can use to combine words to form sentences in a language. Uh, and this is good enough to describe the B's language or their communication system because uh, they don't just have a specific set of like four or five different um, dances they can do they can differentiate various types of the same dance and then they still have sort of different patterns of dances for the different distances of food uh, so they kind of have like three broad patterns and then variations within that so they can exhibit a little bit of creativity um, with this sort of model where they can substitute different specifics into a general pattern <coughs> is this good enough for human language i'll let you think about it i think maybe you can perceive that if I'm going to ask that question, the answer is probably no. Uh, so I'll move on to some different examples which wouldn't work for language model number two. Um, okay, so there are even bigger infinities. Like you could say an infinite number of different things here as long as you can kind of differentiate um, the uh, variables to different levels of specificity. But 
What you can't do is something like this. So you can say in English and in any other language for that matter, uh, you just have to translate the sentence, Bill thinks that Beth is a genius. Okay, Sue suspects that Bill thinks that Beth is a genius. Let's keep going. Charlie said that Sue suspects that Bill thinks that Beth is a genius. John, Jean knows that Charlie said that Sue suspects that Bill thinks that Beth is a genius, so on and so forth. Um, hopefully you can see what's going on here and that I've got an individual sentence here just to start off with, like Beth is a genius, uh, and I can embed that into a larger frame of a sentence such that Bill thinks that Beth is a genius. Uh, and that's another sentence. So this is a sentence by itself, and then this is a bigger sentence containing that other sentence. Uh, and then I can take this whole sentence itself and I can embed that into a bigger sentence, like Sue suspects that Bill thinks that Beth is a genius. Um, so on and so forth. I keep embedding sentences into larger sentences and they keep getting bigger and bigger. And that, there's no reason why I would have to stop other than I might you know, forget all the different details at some point. But formally speaking, if I'm just applying a rule to make these sentences, there's nothing to stop me um, in the English language. Uh, and hopefully you can see that formally. I'll show you what it looks um, in a second in the brain model again. Uh, but it's kind of funny because I used um, examples like this uh, for a long time in teaching this class. And you know, you just kind of have to think, well, again, um, these are weird things to say, but you know, are they useful for us as human beings in terms of survival or whatever? Uh, probably not, we just can say them. But then uh, eventually um, the TV show Friends gave us a weird scenario in which they start to make sense. Um, so I've got some real life examples here. Um, I'll let you listen to them and I'll try to explain them again. Do they know that we know? But see, they don't know that we know that they know. They don't know but see, they that don't we know. know. But see, they don't know that we know that they know. All right, didn't mean to play them all at the same time. Here's the last one. They don't know that we know they know we know. Okay, so uh, as I recall, it's been a while since I've seen that episode, but I believe uh, the characters Monica and Chandler have a secret re relationship going on that they don't want their friends to know about, but then their friends find out about it, and then for some reason the friends try to play that knowledge to their advantage, but then Monica and Chandler try to turn the tables on them, and so on and so forth, so it goes from this sort of scenario. Do they know that we know? Where you embed one sentence. But see, they don't know that we know that they know. And there's two embeddings in that one. They don't know that we know they know we know. And there's three embeddings in that one. And in theory, if they kept going back and forth like that, it could go on forever. But uh, the TV show is limited by a 30 minute time frame, so they had to stop somewhere. Um, yeah, but it works that way, right? Eventually, maybe you might wind up in a scenario where you have to use this sort of linguistic ability. Uh, so how many rules do we need to capture this? Uh, and I've express these various um, sentences using the sort of uh, algebraic notation again. So X verbs that Y is a Z, W verbs that X is verbs that Y is a Z, so on and so forth. Uh, so I can keep increasing or the number of variables in here. And I'm using also verbs as like a placeholder for different kind of verbs. And the letters are just placeholders for different kind of nouns. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so yeah, could you store all these patterns in your heads? Um, Maybe, uh, but eventually if you did that, you kind of run out of space in your brain if you had to store an infinite number of these different things. You probably wouldn't get to infinity, right? Um, so no, you can't really do that because no matter how many you store, there's a longer one, but you can still get this pattern in language. How do you do it? How do you know all those sentences? And it turns out you take advantage of the fact that language can be recursive. So language, um, I, sorry, recursive, in case you've never encountered this term before, um, if you've done computer programming, you probably had to deal with it at some point, but recursive means it's a procedure that can refer to itself. So it's a procedure that can use itself as a procedure, um, which turns out to be an inordinately useful thing. Uh, so in language, rules for producing sentences can be used in rules for producing sentences. Um, I said this is a very useful feature to have. I guess I could, it's maybe more accurate to say it's a very powerful feature to have um, in some sort of expressive system because it means you can express basically an infinite number of infinite things. Um, <clears throat> so humans have to know how to produce sentences that include rules for producing sentences. So before we had like X verbs that Y 
or X is not a Y. And I just had sort of two different placeholders for nouns in my sentence, and then also a placeholder for a verb. Um, but I also have to be able to express sentences of the form sentence equals X verbs that sentence. Um, so this not only includes a placeholder for a noun and a verb, but also a whole sentence, which itself can include individual variables for nouns and verbs, so on and so forth. So it can keep going recursively and, keep, and can keep going infinitely uh, so that we can produce basically anything out there that um, we can think of, at least as far as we know. Um, so here's a quote from the Jackanoff reading, reading uh, who says that we know not just patterns of words, but patterns of patterns. Isn't that nice? So at some level, we have sentences which we can form like X likes Y. And then at another level, we can say X verbs that sentence. Yeah. And that's how we can be infinitely creative with a finite set of rules. So in our brain, um, our brain space is limited. We can't pack everything in the world in there, but we can pack enough patterns in there that we can sort of expand out anything we can say to the infinite, which is amazing. Uh, and therefore, we have a lot more creativity than bees have, even though bees have some creativity as well. Okay, um, so included among the infinite number of things we can say is a lot of complete nonsense, as I've kind of alluded to, which may or may not ever be useful. Um, but here are some examples from both Noam Chomsky and Lewis Carroll, the famous, uh, famous author who wrote Alice in Wonderland. Uh, so Chomsky's, one of Chomsky's most famous phrases is, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Okay, um, I think we can all kind of parse this or realize that it is a sentence that kind of works together, but what does it mean exactly? Like how can an idea be green? And if it is green, how can that green idea be colorless exactly? And do ideas sleep? Probably not. Uh, and if you sleep, can you sleep furiously? No, but yeah, I can put all these words together and it sounds like a sentence uh, because it fits into sort of the patterns of sentences that I've seen before, right? Even though the words might not make sense with each other. Um, another one, I think this is from uh, the Jack and Duff reading. I'm memorizing the score of the sonata I hope to compose someday. So this is a weird little paradox as well. So the sonata has not been composed and yet I'm still memorizing it. Yeah, maybe you can say this is how composition works, but it's sort of like a weird, weird paradoxical poetic way of saying it. Uh, you can just say I'm composing the sonata if you wanted to say that. But yeah, here's another kind of example of weirdness from Lewis Carroll, uh, who liked to play with language a lot. Uh, this is a poem he wrote. I think it's from Through the Looking Glass, the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, and it starts off, "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave." Blah. What does that mean? Who knows, because we don't know what any of these words mean. Although, if you read the book, he walks you through what they're supposed to mean, and it does start to kind of make sense, and at least the meter is nice, so it sounds like a poem. Um, I can give you another example. This one's kind of fun for me at least. If you're a geek, you might enjoy it as well. Uh, even if you're not a geek, hopefully you'll find it kind of fun. Uh, so this is um, a postmodernism generator. So this is kind of a, well, it is a computer program which, which generates uh, fancy sounding gibberish, I guess, you, I guess you could say. So it just takes a bunch of words that, and phrases that people often use in sort of, you know, erudite academic literature uh, and puts them together in newly repackaged form uh, to make it sound like a paper that some, you know, professor of literature at Amherst might actually write, um, but it doesn't actually mean anything. So this particular version of this is entitled The Prematerial Paradigm of Consensus in Neo-Capitalist Materialism. Dialectic Destructuralism in Neo-Semanticist Cultural Theory. Oh, it sounds like some topics we're talk, uh, touching upon. Society is intrinsically used in the service of outdated perceptions of language, says Leotard. However, according to Prynne, it is not so much society that is intrinsically used in the service of outdated perceptions of language, but rather the absurdity, and thus the economy of society. Uh, and just to show you what's going on here, I'm going to refresh or reload the page. Here we go. We can get another one. Yep, yeah, there we go. This one, post-cultural nationalism and neocultural discourse from the University of Illinois. Context of stasis. Sexual identity is fundamentally impossible, says Lacan. However, according to Prynne, it is not so much sexual identity that is fundamentally impossible, rather the dialectic and subsequent paradigm of sexual identity. 
Okay, before you get upset about any of these statements, just know that none of them are intentional. Um, it's just a computer making stuff up. Um, and it's not real. Uh, and this actually, I just discovered today, this has a similar link to adolescent poetry. Um, so for any of you adolescent poets out there, you might find a sympathetic spirit in this computer which can generate poems. So this one is entitled, I Am by the Aggregate Kid. I am the sun, come shining though. No one will two minds loving still. Everything I put, ever put my heart broken to when he will still not come. Deep in caves below death lies in the future. I see a guarded look come into his un, uh, something eyes. Okay, that almost worked. <laughs> Here's another one. I'm not very popular, even though I'm nice I was. People told me that as a horse. But to say to you and you and lying on my B-Day, he gave me courage to be someday. Yeah, that one's actually not that bad. Um, so, yeah, I think as human beings, we can do better than a random computer, hopefully. Um, but the computer is kind of using rules that it has deciphered from what human beings do to try to do the same thing that human beings do. And as, insofar as it matches up the rules that we use to generate language, like in literature or poetry or whatever, it makes sense to us. It has potentially some meaning. Um, but it doesn't have to add meaning. It just has to work in terms of how you put the different elements together. Okay, so yeah. Nonsense sentences work because they fit in with the patterns formed by the sentences that actually do make sense and that we use every day. So you can compare the sentences from the previous slide with these, like large green lizards sleep soundly. Uh, that one works and it makes sense to us too. We can imagine a scenario where this might be said. I'm memorizing the score of the sonata I hope to perform someday. So it's already composed, you just need to play it. Uh, we can kind of convert Lewis Carroll's poem into Twas Evening and the slimy toads that squirm and wiggle in the cage. Okay, now we've got language and we can start talking. Uh, but we had it before too because what was being said earlier still followed the same rules as these meaningful sentences. Okay, here's a totally different difference from the sentences that work. So you can also put these words in this order. Green sleep ideas, furiously colorless. That couldn't possibly mean anything because we can't even make any sense of how these words work together. Or I'm memorizing the perform of the score I sonata to hope someday. No one would ever say that um, because that's not how our language works. Our rules don't allow us to generate these sentences. Brilla again, slyly on the toves, wave gimbal in the gyre and did. These don't work. Um, so just because we can say an infinite number of things doesn't mean we can say anything. There are still limits on the system, which is kind of cool. So we have a framework of rules which allow us to kind of spread out to infinity, but there are still boundaries between what is okay and what is not okay. Not okay. Um, and then that's part of our jobs as linguists is to figure out where are those boundaries in this sort of amazingly creative system. How can there still be boundaries that have to be there somewhere because otherwise the rules wouldn't allow us to be so productive. Uh, screwed up the uh, animation here a little bit on my slide. Uh, I think we'll survive. But the set of rules that we know for creating sentences in a language is the grammar of that language, technical term. So I want you to remember this term because we're gonna keep coming back to it and it's an important one. But the rules of grammar that we know are very abstract. They're the set of rules we know for creating sentences in a language. Uh, they have to allow us to be able to express patterns of patterns or they have to take that form for us um, in order to be able to explain how we can create these infinitely um, hierarchical, infinitely long sentences that embed other sentences in them. Um, so what's on the other side of the boundaries of grammar? Strings of words which do not adhere to these rules are called ungrammatical. Uh, so yeah, like I said before, we're trying to find out as linguists what the boundaries of grammar are for any particular language and also for human languages in general. Um, I'll touch upon that in a second, but it's called universal grammar. So if these rules are so abstract, how did we figure out what they are? Um, how do we learn language? This, so the question of you know, what is grammatical and what is not grammatical in any language is difficult to figure out uh, the answer to. Trying to figure it out for all languages it also is quite difficult, although you might be surprised at how much progress linguists have made on that. Another, maybe even more mysterious question to try to figure out an answer to is the question of how you can acquire this infinite creativity. The rules 
are very abstract and all we get are examples. So when kids encounter language as they're growing up, they have to learn from those examples. We don't even know exactly explicitly what the rules are for language. So even linguists can't transmit them exactly in their absolute perfect form to kids because well, first of all, how can you talk to a kid who doesn't know language to begin with? And then how can you talk about the rules when you don't know exactly what they are? Instead, you give kids the examples and you don't do it like, oh, here, Billy, I'm going to show you how to create a sentence. You just say a sentence of some sort because you have to talk to the kid at some point. <clears throat> OK, and then from those examples, the kid figures out what's going on. Um, keep talking about the kid but you did this I did this parents did that your kids are going to do this it's going to keep going as long as there are human beings uh, and it's amazing that it happens but it works the human species has figured it out um, that knowledge though that we get out of the process is subconscious we can't bring it explicitly to mind we just kind of have to if we want to if we want to be linguists try to figure it out um, sort of after the fact of learning a language. So an analogy which is given for this, which may be more applicable to some of us than others, but is that of driving a car. Um, so probably you've learned how to drive a car at this point in your life. You might not. Uh, my wife, God bless her, still hasn't gotten her license, but hopefully someday. Uh, anyways, if you drive a car, uh, you know what you're supposed to do with like turning the steering wheel and turning your like turn signal on or you know pressing on the brake or the accelerator. Um, but you don't have to know exactly like how an engine works or what a spark plug does or what your exhaust system is doing or whatever. Um, all those little technical details of what's going on underneath the hood. You don't need to know that and most people don't in order to be able to drive a car. So. We can kind of describe the process of driving a car at this general, broad, higher level, but um, in the same way that we can kind of describe what's going on with language, like talking about nouns and verbs, I think most people know that. Uh, but most people don't know the mechanics of what's going on in the nitty gritty of language, just in the same way they don't know the mechanics of what's going on in their engine um, or their brake system or what have, or what have you. So the knowledge that we have as human users of language as human knowers of language is difficult to characterize because nobody teaches it to us explicitly. Like you, I'm also pretty sure you went through English class in high school or wherever uh, where they taught you some rules of grammar and we'll talk about those rules of grammar next time. Um, those are uh, for the most part just kind of superficial add-ons to a very complex system of um, expressive language that you have and have been developing ever since you were a little kid. Uh, so what is explicitly taught to you is generally speaking not a very natural way to speak and it's actually kind of hard to acquire. Um, so most linguists just kind of ignore that part and we'll talk about it again next time about what to ignore and what not to ignore in language. Uh, and what we don't want to ignore is what just people do naturally without having explicit instruction uh, given to them because there are patterns of what you do without any sort of explicit instruction. And that's cool um, that that can emerge through just the natural process of acquiring language. So um, because we get a very abstract system out of a limited number of language examples that we encounter in life as we grow up from infancy, um, people have looked at this and said, oh, we can't do that. Like if we don't do that without explicit instruction, it's so hard that we can't do it without some sort of help, some sort of basically biological help. Um, so this is a slightly controversial theory. People have gone back and forth about this. Um, I'm not gonna present it to you as dogma, but I do want you to know about it. So the claim is that every human being has what's called a language acquisition device which is abbreviated LAD. Uh, so the idea here is that there's like a, you know, a chunk of your brain, which is devoted to just figuring out how language works when you're born and encounter language as an infant. Uh, it starts to get to work basically right away to get you up to speed with the system so that when you're, you know, by the age you're three or four or five or whatever, you can start communicating with people around you. 
Um, so this LAD or language acquisition device is supposed to be innate, it's supposed to be part of your genetic endowment as a human being, um, and it's knowledge of language, or at least knowledge of how to acquire language. <clears throat> Yeah, so I've kind of walked you through that part. And the tricky part of this is that anytime you talk about language acquisition, there are kind of basic patterns we see in that process as well. But um, there also has to be specifics that deal with the language you actually encounter. So when you acquire a language, you're not acquiring just language in general. You're acquiring, say, German or Spanish or Wolof or something like that, right? There has to be some specific knowledge you acquire from the environment, um, which is not simply innate in your brain when you're born. Okay, but the LAD theory makes some interesting and important predictions. So number one, uh, there's this prediction of what I referred to before as universal grammar. So we have a specific grammar for English, we have a specific grammar for German, we have a specific grammar for whatever, Filipino. Um, we have to know that if we want to speak those languages. But then the idea is that there are universal features shared across all those different languages. So every single language should, should share features in common due to the way we acquire language and due to sort of the innate genetic endowment we have for language in our brains. Um, and kind of our goal as linguists is to figure out what these universal boundaries, what these universal structures and patterns of language are. Okay, supposedly they're made possible by the LAD. Uh, and a basic example, which I've mentioned before, is that all languages have nouns and verbs. So you can count on that no matter what language you're talking about. We have these specific items. And then more abstractly, um, there are going to be rules for how nouns and verbs can fit together in a sentence. Um, we're not ready to talk about that yet, but when we get into syntax later, we'll start to see some of that structure emerge and be able to talk about it a little bit more easily. Um, there's another prediction made by this theory, uh, which is interesting and also a bit controversial, but it's called poverty of the stimulus. So this is saying that there should be properties of language that people know without ever having experienced them. Um, so when you start out as a baby, you got something in your brain which just says, you know, I'm looking for language, I'll help you figure out the language that you hear as you grow up, and then you know, you'll become a, use, or a competent speaker of the language uh, when you become an adult. Uh, and then there's gonna be elements of that language that you have to encounter in the world in order to learn or know like the specific words of the language you grew up to speak. Um, so it's kind of a trade-off between those two parts of your development. Um, some of it is innate, some of it is experienced. Uh, but the poverty of the stimulus theory says there's got to be something in there that we can observe, um, which you've never really experienced before, but you still know. Um, it's a funny kind of knowledge. Uh, so yeah, here's a funny pattern, which may be an example of this. Um, people have noticed this in syntax research over the years, and it seems to apply across the board to um, many different languages. But people like to put lists of adjectives in a particular order. And this is what the quick write was about. So I hope you did it before you look at this, because I'm, I'm about to reveal the answer. Um, so yeah, normally I'd say, what orders do you choose for the examples in the quick write? Uh, here is one postulated order that most English speakers prefer. It's supposed to be opinion, size, shape, age, color, origin, material. Um, and you can look at the particular sentence that you picked for um, the three options uh, or the three sets of sentences in the quick write. And you can see if that lines up with how you were, which sentence you picked, if they actually go in this order um, in your preferred option or not. But the thing is, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different sort of qualities here. Um, and the idea is, or the observation is, that they all go in this order all the time. That's what people want to do. And I think, I don't want to go too far off the handle here, but if there are seven different qualities, then there should be seven factorial ways of putting them together, which I think is something like 5,040 different possible orders. Hopefully I'm not wrong with that number, but um, think about it. There are 5,040 different ways to express these things. 
um, and we pick one consistently. Uh, so like you don't hear all 5,040 different options or maybe you don't even think about them um, when you encounter adjectives in the world around you when you're growing up. You get a far more limited experience than that, um, but you wind up in the same place as everybody else. Okay, how'd that happen? Maybe the order's in your head to begin with and you don't have to encounter it. Uh, you just know it. Um, I've got a question here. Does it work for languages that are not English? Those of you who are native speakers of language that are not English can kind of confirm or deny that that's the case for your particular language. I'd be interested in knowing. Um, but linguists are basically still trying to figure out why exactly languages operate like this. Uh, it's kind of a cool little mystery. <clears throat> Give you a slightly more complicated example, and this will again make more sense when we talk about syntax and the syntax module for this course. So I've got a sentence here. The boy who is sleeping is dreaming of a new car. And you can convert this into what's called a yes, no question, which is a question to which the answer is yes or no. Um, and hopefully you can see how that's done. But if you can't, I'll just show it to you. You can say, is the boy who is sleeping dreaming of a new car? OK, um, no, he's not. Uh, he's dreaming of, you know, a new language or something. Uh, so, yeah, this is how you would convert this. You take this verb here and you swing it up to the front and everything else is in the same order. Um, it turns out when you convert this into a yes, no question, uh, or when kids learn how to convert this into a yes, no question as they acquire language, they never ever make a mistake like this. They never say, is the boy who's sleeping is dreaming of a new car. So we've got the same verb here around the word sleeping in the original, uh, is, um, and you have to take this is and move it to the front, but somehow kids never screw up and they never take this is and move it up to the front instead. Why do they not make that mistake? Um, it turns out this who is sleeping is kind of a sentence that's embedded in this larger sentence, right? And it's actually embedded kind of in a way that's connecting it to this the boy at the beginning of the sentence to make this whole thing the subject. Um, so kids somehow know that that's the structure um, and that this whole thing kind of works together in as, as a unit and you can't split it up. And instead you have to deal with this next is, which is kind of a totally different part of the sentence, uh, the main verb. Um, yeah, so kids figure that out. They don't make that mistake. Um, so how do they know that's the case? They kind of never hear counterexamples. They hear only right examples and they don't make the wrong move in that particular case. There's another example that's given for um, there being sort of poverty of the stimulus elements in how kids acquire language. They know this. They know not to make the mistake without sort of having um, any clear evidence that they should not do that in what they experience. So um, we've talked a lot about sort of the biological aspects of nature uh, at this point, um, but this sort of intuition you have about how language works and the sort of pre-existing knowledge you have without experiencing it in the language world around you uh, is, yeah, it's described as an intuition. So the next reading after the Jack and Dolph reading is from a book um, from Steven Pinker called The Language Instinct. Uh, I guess I'll point out here uh, in July 2020 that Steven Pinker has recently become a controversial figure uh, for reasons I'm not totally going to get into, but um, if you want to follow up on that and figure out what's going on with him, you can read up about it on the internet. I'm sure it has a lot to say about the topic. Uh, so uh, some people might be annoyed by the fact that we're going to read something for Pink from Pinker in this language, but I just say try to approach it with an open mind and you're welcome to make whatever or draw whatever conclusions you want to. Uh, about his work. But the main point is he wrote a book called The Language Instinct, uh, which is kind of a fun read, uh, but it, it's kind of theory, it's primary moral is that we have an instinct to acquire language in the same way that other animals have instincts that are not taught to them explicitly, but are simply there from birth. Uh, and they simply execute them to be functional biological beings in the world. So baby turtles, you know, which emerge from eggs, which are buried under the sand uh, on the beach by their mothers. Uh, they break out of the eggs at some point, they break out of the sand, they just start crawling to, toward the ocean. Nobody has to teach them to do that. They do it and it helps them survive as turtles. Not all of them make it, but enough of them do to kind of keep repeating the pattern. Um, the reason they don't make it is because other predators might get them. If you're a human being and you have this instinct for acquiring language, 
you're going to make it uh, unless something really wrong happens to you, which basically hardly ever happens in the modern human world. Uh, that's your instinct. It will help you survive in the human world, um, basically, which to us at this point um, is basically kind of more important than the natural world because uh, we need to, to be able to do function together with and work with uh, other human beings in order to be kind of human ourselves. Um, okay, so the big goal of linguistics as a science is to figure out how universal grammar works, i.e. what are the fundamental rules that are common to all languages. Um, understanding universal grammar should reveal to us part of what makes human beings unique as a species. Um, so that's kind of a cool goal to have to, you know, in order to understand ourselves, we have to be able to understand language. Um, at least I think it's cool. I hope you do too. But uh, either way, um, we're going to get started on the more technical aspects of that after one more lecture about the kind of general themes of linguistics next time. Uh, but after that, we'll start talking about morphology, which is the science of how words are put together or the scientific understanding of how words are put together. And just as a preview for that, I'm going to let you know I posted some video links to the course webpage. Uh, so I've found in teaching this class uh, over the years that um, not everybody has a good handle on what the lexical categories of language are. Uh, so categories like nouns and verbs, then also trickier ones like adverbs and prepositions, so on and so forth. So I've put some links on the main homepage for that, uh, which will give you, hopefully this will work for me, um, yeah, uh, some uh, old schoolhouse rock videos which I grew up with back in the 70s, if you can believe it. Uh, so these are, I guess, maybe a bit old fashioned by this point, but you might enjoy them nonetheless. I'm usually wide awake. I love to take a walk through the garden. Because they put everything in song form. So, um, on a lighthearted note to end this one, um, you can learn the song Conjunction Junction, which everybody my age knows by heart. Uh, and it may also help you um, understand some of the primary um, units of language that we're going to use to analyze the structure of words in a couple of lectures. Uh, if you know that stuff already, if you feel confident with it, don't worry about that. But if you want to have a little bit of fun wasting time, you can re watch those videos. Uh, just to let you know, I'm not going to click on this, but if you watch the adverbs video, um, that song will be stuck in your head for the rest of the day easily. Uh, so just use that one with caution. Uh, and otherwise, um, I'll see you next time to talk about prescriptive grammar. All right. See you then.